Hello, everybody. Welcome to um, yet another session of Pitapalooza 2021. Um, we have three talks in this block, so we'll get started with the first one right away. Um, it's Todd Carpenter, who's the executive director of NISO, one of the organizers of Pitapalooza. Um, and I'll let Todd take it away. All right, fantastic. Thank you, John. <clears throat> So hi everyone, uh, my name is Todd Carpenter, as John mentioned. I am the executive director of NISO, that's the National Information Standards Organization in the United States. Uh, but for this particular session, I'm also speaking uh, as chair of an ISO working group that is uh, focused on the development of ISO principles of identification, which is the topic of the talk today. Uh, I am also going to be talking about the creation of the Optipitamus Prime. I have put in the chat a link to a YouTube video of how to make your own uh, Optipitamus. Uh, this takes far longer than 30 minutes. So, uh, and even if you're good at origami, I think the video is um, more than half an hour. Um, and it took me like maybe an hour and a half or two hours because um, I am not good at arts and crafts. So there is the YouTube uh, link. A shout out to Easy Origami. Uh, that's a YouTube channel uh, that develops pop culture paper toys. Um, so uh, kudos to them for showing me and all of you how to do it. Uh, and it all starts with a simple piece of paper. So where do we start? Uh, I am going to be talking a bit about ISO TC46 SC9, uh, who we are, what we do, what is NISO's role in that? Uh, then I'm going to get into the principles of identification themselves. I should note, this is a work in progress. I spoke about this last year uh, during the uh, meeting in Lisbon. We had a pub quiz, which was amazing. Uh, we actually handed out uh, actual uh, bottles of port to the winners there. Uh, but in the subsequent year, we've settled on a variety of things and we're kind of getting close to publication. So it is a big world and it needs standards. There are a variety of sources of standards related to identifiers, both the schemas themselves, the metadata that are associated with them, how, the, uh, how those standards are applied in the community. Uh, it is a complicated world and we need standards to make those things happen. One of the organizations that develops standards for the in the identifier space is the ISO Technical Committee 46. This is information and documentation. Uh, think of it as all things libraries, but all things also media. Uh, there are five subcommittees that work within TC46. They're focused on technical interoperability. This is where Dublin Core and ILL standards reside. Uh, statistics and performance. This is where things like uh, valuations reside. Identification and description, which is identifiers, obviously. Uh, document storage, preservation, as well as archives and records management are all part of this large technical committee. And identification and description is a subcommittee within that. This committee is responsible for the variety of identifiers. I know, I realize you probably can't see that, uh, but a variety of the identifiers that you were would certainly recognize: ISBNs, ISSNs, DOIs, ISNIs, um, the Recording Code, International Standard Recording Code, and a variety of other identifiers, as well as metadata standards uh, and descriptive standards related to to uh, our space. So what is NISO's role here? Uh, we represent US interests to ISO in this area of Technical Committee 46. We also represent US interests to another joint Technical Committee on Document Processing Languages, yada, yada, yada. Uh, in addition to that, we also serve as the secretariat for this identifier group in a kind of convoluted uh, web, if you will. So NISO is accredited by the American National Standards Institute. That's the National Institute 
in the United States that develops and accredits standards developers in the US. ANSI is the member of ISO, and we are a member of ANSI, therefore uh, that's how we participate. We are, ANSI is the organization that is the secretariat, and we are uh, tasked with the responsibilities of managing that secretariat. Uh, we also um, partner with uh, Stella Griffiths, who is the chair of SC9. She is the executive director at the International ISBN Agency. So it's a kind of overlapping uh, network of organizations that participate. So this process starts to look like something after the conversations that we had last year. Uh, the project that we're going to be talking about has been underway for about 18 months, which is fairly quick for an ISO project, uh, but necessarily uh, not necessarily the, the longest or shortest time frame for development of a project. We are at the draft technical report stage. Uh, this is just about to go out for ballot as a final ballot. Uh, after we had a ballot last year, we got uh, a couple, maybe a hundred or something comments on that draft. Uh, we've then revised that draft last fall, and we're now ready to circulate that amongst the members. Um, another interesting and uh, another important part about technical reports, ISO technical reports, these are not standards. They are non-normative. Uh, they do not have the, the force of law of an ISO standard, if you will. Um, it doesn't include shells and wills and all of those things that standards have. It's a way of describing best practice. It's a way of describing the way that people should act. The process, be the document itself begins with an introduction and then it gets into standard definitions. There are a variety of definitions in our space. Uh, there are a variety of identifier standards that include things uh, around um, uh, many aspects of identifiers, uh, but there isn't a lot of consistency. Uh, a lot of these terms are vaguely understood. Uh, we kind of vaguely know what we mean when we say metadata, or we have a definition of what metadata is, but how does it apply to identifiers? There's a variety of types of metadata. Uh, what do we mean when we say persistence, uh, reference, resolutions, what is the sector that the or the community that an identifier um, relies on. So we start with a section on definitions. I'll go through just examples of the of a few of them. Again, this is in draft stage. Uh, so a lot of this is still a work in progress. And these aren't I'm not going to read out the definitions that we have. Uh, but I'm just going to touch on a few of them like persistence. We use this term a lot. It's in the title of this conference. It's in uh, the core of what we talk about, PIDs. Um, but what do we really mean? What persists? There are a variety of things that can persist. The identifier itself, uh, the binding between the identifier and the referent. Um, there is the persistence of the resolution systems. So you can have an identifier that continues right, uh, without having the resolution system that gets you to the thing. There is the persistence of the metadata. And this is important because metadata changes over time. Um, so are we talking about the persistence of all of the metadata? Are we talking about the administrative metadata? Um, there is the persistence of the I entire identification system itself. Um, so what persists, for how long, uh, these are important things that we need to discuss when we talk about persistence. Another is metadata. There's all sorts of metadata in our community. It is a persistent problem with identifiers. Um, this is also somewhat vague because there is a variety of metadata around identifiers. There is something that we are defining as kernel metadata. Kernel metadata is the minimum, minimum set of referent attributes that are sufficient to uniquely identify the referent. It's not all of the information. It is not all of the information that one might possibly have that is even outside of the identification system. 
Um, there is identifier metadata. This is the sort of thing that might go into a metadata schema. So these are attributes that describe the, uh, the referent. And then there is referent metadata, which is everything. Uh, all of the attributes uh, that are associated with the referent. Um, those could be uh, specific to the referent. Uh, there is also administrative metadata, which is metadata about the identifier itself, which is also critically important. Was this changed? Was it updated? Uh, if so, when? Uh, was the identifier moved from one registration organization to another? So those are just some examples of some of the definitions that we talk about. Uh, I'm now going to talk about the next segment of the document is a variety of information uh, about the un um, ideal attributes of an identifier system, which are, again, kind of the, um, the core elements of the identifier itself, it identifier system itself. This is sort of what we want the ultimate um, optimist, optopitamus to look like. And he doesn't quite look like uh, on the screen. And we want to acknowledge, right, that some of these elements might not be applicable in every circumstance. Um, existing systems, for example, might not have these identifiers, uh, might not have these attributes. That's OK. Uh, we are not a perfect system. Uh, these are ideal. And again, I want to stress, this is not a standard. It's not normative. It should be used as guidance. Um, so I'm going to give some examples of some of the things that are we put down as ideal attributes of identifiers. So uniqueness. Uh, uniqueness is critically important for identifier systems to work, that the identifier is generally the referent. The identifier is generally unique within its namespace. So along these lines, some basic uh, core principles of identifiers. Don't use the same identifier twice. If you have used that number for one referent, don't use that identifier for another referent. Um, oddly enough, this happens a lot. Uh, it creates unbelievable problems. Also, don't assign multiple identifiers to the same referent. Again, this happens a lot. Um, set up systems that can check uh, whether or not the pre this referent has been used previously. Uh, some of this, as you'll note, is pretty obvious. But sometimes, uh, some things, uh, even though they are obvious, should be said. Uh, persistence, again, I mentioned this as a thing. Uh, but an ideal attribute uh, of a persistent, of a PID system is that it provides stability and trust over time because it is persistent. Now, how do you get to persistence? Persistence involves updating metadata. It involves technical support. It involves financial stability of the uh, identification system. There are many elements of persistence, uh, things like good governance. All of these are elements of what makes uh, uh, a, a persistent identifier system uh, trustworthy. Another issue here is ambiguity. And persistent identifiers should not be ambiguous. In order to reach, to get to a state where we avoid ambiguity, the kernel metadata, the core information, should be comprehensive enough to ensure uniqueness and should be uh, unique enough to create that binding between the identifier and the referent. Another issue is access. Um, we are talking about public identifier systems here. There are a variety of uh, proprietary identifier systems, which that's fine if you want a proprietary identifier. You don't necessarily need to share information about uh, your identifier system, your metadata, et cetera. 
ident we are talking public um, primarily about identifier systems that are public. So for shared identifiers, the identifier and the kernel metadata should be publicly available. Now, when we say publicly available, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's free, that it's accessible to anyone. It's accessible to anyone who wants it, and you might have to pay for it. We acknowledge that there are identifier systems whose persistence and financial models are built on controlling the metadata and providing access to the metadata. That is, should be acceptable. Uh, you know, if, an organ, if a persistent identifier system wants to make all of the uh, data available free, that's great, good for you. Um, but the kernel metadata should be available publicly to facilitate its use. You need to understand, like understanding that my ORCID has 40008-2432 um, isn't terribly useful unless you can get access to the ORCID metadata associated with that. And so it doesn't have to be absolutely everything about me and my scholarly output, et cetera. What it needs to be is sufficient to, okay, here is, um, Here's the ID and here's the metadata associated with it. Another thing that we recommend is I persistent identifiers should avoid semantics in the identifier itself. You should avoid encoding meaning in the identifier string. Um, so there are a couple uh, caveats to this. So the first is the prefix, which says, um, ISNI colon identifier uh, string, um, that prefix, fine. We That's useful to know that this is an ISNI uh, or this is an ORCID or this is an ISBN. It's not just some random 16 digit number. Also, a variety of persistent identifier systems use information at the point of minting to create the identifier. So some publishers use uh, some algorithm of publication, issue, date, page, et cetera, to come up with their DOI strings. That's fine as long as no, no one presumes that that is meaningful after the fact. That is the critically important element of this because DOIs could move from publisher to publisher. Uh, another is resilience. Uh, this is something that most people don't often think of when they think of persistent identifier systems. It's certainly, you know, those of us in the PID community probably think of this, but it's certainly not something that your average user would think of. But how does the system react to errors? Uh, because there are errors. Uh, maybe the same identifier is, is given out twice to, uh, or not the same identifier given out twice, but the same uh, referent is used twice. How do you fix that? How do you fix errors in metadata? So how do we, uh, this identification system should be uh, robust enough to fix those errors, and there should be established mechanisms to provide user feedback to say, hey, I found a problem, let's fix this problem. Uh, another ideal attribute has to focus on is focused on resolution. Um, how do you resolve the identifier to its kernel metadata, um, or possibly the actual referent uh, in a digital system? So wherever possible, identifiers should be actionable. Now, if you put an identifier in print on the back of a book, uh, that might not be actionable. Fine, uh, but wherever possible make those identifiers uh, actionable in our system. So we're almost done, only a couple more minutes. What's left to do with this project? As I mentioned, we're in our final drafting stage. Um, the final draft is being prepared for circulation amongst members of ISO TC46 SC9. That is the group that will uh, ballot and comment on the final draft. It'll be out for roughly eight weeks, uh, beginning in February, uh, probably near the beginning of February, then the latter, latter stage. 
Um, the first draft uh, was approved uh, unanimously. There were no negative votes, so I expect the next draft will be approved, hopefully. Uh, but you know, it's all dependent on the members. If those members approve the uh, technical report, and presuming there are no significant editorial changes that we need to make, hopefully this technical report will be published by May. Um, we will be continuing to speak out about the technical report, particularly once it's finished. Uh, we hope that all of the persistent identifier community will read it, uh, we'll review it, we'll use it in the development both of new identifier systems as well as a guide to support improvements and revisions to existing identifier systems as we move forward. Uh, there's a link here to the uh, ISO page that contains the, the recommendation itself, uh, or it will when the recommendation is published. Uh, but that is, a at the moment, a stub page that has information about the project. And again, publication is contingent upon approval. So with that, um, if I've been tweeting out for the last couple weeks how to create your own Optipitamus. Uh, I would love to see if anyone has built one. Um, you also might see in the video, you can turn this into a truck. Uh, I didn't. I haven't yet, uh, because I fear that if I took it apart, I wouldn't be able to put it back together. Um, so better to stick with, <laughs> stick with it in one form uh, before you make it to the next. So with that, I will sure. I can draw jump to a real quick. quick. Yeah, I, thank you for the presentation. And um, we did have some questions. Um, I think the, the most recent question came from Howard Ratner, who also mentioned that um, ISO committees sound like Star Wars droids. Um, and his question is, will there be a short form recommendation that we will all be able to get behind? So I think the question more around the kind of for, short form recommendation. Um, the technical report itself is only runs to like eight pages. Um, and that includes like all of the well, I, I think it's 12 pages with all of the front matter and the back matter and the bibliography. So the ideal attributes itself, I think, is like three pages. So it is pretty tight. Um, so I hope everybody can get behind it. Um, Great, yeah. Um, sometimes documentation, the word documentation is too long of a word. So it, it can be intimidating. Um, uh, at, earlier in your talk, you were talking about um, maintenance and how to projects, you know, stability and maintenance. And uh, Catherine Kaiser asked, with all the technical chaos in the IT world, how do communities provide financial stability for maintenance? I know that's a, a very broad topic, but maybe something that your team's done? Um, we, this particular technical report is focused at a very high level um, and try to be broadly applicative not only for scholarly identifiers, but also trade identifiers and, you know, banking identifiers, everything that um, is is uh, out there. Um, although TC46 is primarily focused on um, media. Um, the larger question, though, about uh, financial stability uh, and persistence is a thorny one. Um, you know, particularly these systems cost money. Uh, everyone, no one should be confused that oh, I just assign identifiers and you know put up a web page and there you go. Um, maintenance of these systems takes time, effort, and money, even for the most simplest of, of projects. Um, you know, uh, we're involved in the um, the identifiers for language codes. And one would think there aren't that many new languages uh, developed, but there are. Um, we need, you know, Dothraki got a new language code. Um, so even those things take time and maintenance. Uh, and sometimes languages go away. Uh, financial stability is a really big problem. Um, and we could probably spend two full days of Pitapalooza talking about it. Yeah, absolutely. And if I knew um, how to say thank you in Dothraki, I would. 
Um, do, do they but, say thank you? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But I do know that clapping is the universal language of, um, of appreciation. So thank you very much, uh, Todd. I, um, people who are new to the Pitapalooza format, people just joining, um, the questions that we weren't able to ask are being moved over to Slack. So um, Nettie, who's backstage, is going to move those over to this Q&A area of Slack. And we'll um, at this people who ask them and, and Todd can continue the conversation yeah. there. And yeah. one, one comment that came in was just, um, can you put the link to where the ISO um, standard is going to be in the, the Slack channel as well, just so people can track that? Uh, yeah, I'll do that now. And thank you all for the time. Uh, really appreciate it.